All right. All right, first service, we didn't really get to the good part, and they kind of got upset about that. And so it was, it was really interesting to, to hear that song being played during offering. Uh, first service, but hey, welcome to you Sunday, all right? That's what, that's what we get. So like I said earlier, um, we are wanting to invite the church, we want to invite you guys into what a Wednesday night um, looks like um, for our youth ministry. I start out every Wednesday night with saying two things. And if you notice, I keep saying youth ministry and not um, youth group. And that's intentional. Uh, Something that um, I really, truly believe in is us being a ministry. When when I hear the youth group, um, not that there's anything wrong or people that say youth group or are wrong in some way. But when I hear youth group, I hear kind of a, a closed group, kind of, you know, we're our youth group. And we want to be a youth ministry that is open and goes out into the community and is loving on the people around us. So you'll notice that uh, I will 90 something percent of the time, I will say youth ministry. Every now and then I revert back to my old days and say youth group. But I start out with two things. I start with a Bible verse every Wednesday night. And this was chosen about a year and a half ago, right in the heart of COVID. We had a few Bible verses we were looking at. We wanted, wanted to pick one that would fit who we are as a youth ministry. And so 1 Peter 4, 8a says, above all, some Wednesdays they say it really, really quietly, and I have to make them say it a second time, but that was, that, was, that was good enough, all right? So above all, love each other deeply, okay? Above all, even when we don't like the person so much, even when we're in fights or arguments, even when um, it's just somebody that we maybe don't care about at all, the Bible tells us that we are to, above all, love each other deeply. And so that's who we want to be as a youth ministry, There may be some people that walk into our church as a church ministry. There may be people that walk in and and they may not be our cup of tea type of person, but God says love them deeply, okay? That's how we ought to act individually and as a church. And then the second thing is kind of what our purpose statement is, okay? We are to love God. Now, you know I'm going to make you do that a second time. We are to love God. All right, much better. All right, we love God, and because we love God, we love others, okay? And if we really love others, then we go out into the world and we share of the love of God, okay? And so that's who we want to be as a youth ministry and as individuals. I like to share stories when I preach, Okay, that's just, that's just kind of who I am. That's just kind of how I am. When, I, when I'm going to preach a sermon, I like to tell a story. I like to find parts of my life or parts of lives of people that I know with their permission and share something that might help illustrate the topic or the message that we're going to be preaching. And so I've got to be honest with you. Um, I spent the last couple of weeks preparing for this this sermon and this message. And I can't honestly stand up here and say that I can really find a moment in my life where I can, I really um, have experienced what we're talking about. Okay. I can't, I can't sit here and say, yeah, let me, I mean, I, I've had moments in my life where I have, I have stood firm for who Christ is and who Christ is in my life. And I've had moments where I probably didn't, but I can't stand here and say that I have had those moments where I stood firm and then I was persecuted because of it. And so this morning we're talking about persecution and what it looks like to be persecuted. So I've asked Nathan if he would come and read our scripture. We've been in the Beatitudes. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 for several weeks now. So he's going to read to us Matthew 5 verses 1 through 12. And it will be on the screen so you can follow along. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. Bless are the poor in spirit, for the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless those who mourn, for they will be com- comfort, comforted. Sorry. Bless 
are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger for the thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are, merc- blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecuted because of righteousness, theirs is in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because their great is your reward in heaven for the For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. Thank you, Nathan. (laughs) Blessed are those who are persecuted. I think my first question would be, really? Like, did Jesus really say blessed are those who are persecuted. When we hear those two words, um, blessed and persecuted, those aren't two words that we typically would say go hand in hand, right? I don't think we would typically sit here and say, yeah, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I, got, I was persecuted and that was a blessing. I was blessed. I don't think that that's how we see things and yet Jesus uses them in such a way. Jesus uses them in a way that they go hand in hand. And so there's a few things that I think we must first understand before we can know what this passage is telling us. First, Jesus is giving this message to real people. I say that because sometimes we can read scripture and it just can be just writing. This isn't something that Jesus just wrote down and somebody found. This isn't something that somebody else wrote that they thought Jesus would say. These are Jesus's words. The Bible is living, it is breathing, and it is active. The Bible was not just written thousands of years ago, only meant to speak to people of that time. The Bible says that the word became flesh, and that flesh is Jesus. And so Jesus is the word, and Jesus is living. So we can know that the word, and when Jesus speaks, it matters. It has truth. And it has something to say for our life some 2,000 years later. So Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are persecuted. You know, there's this one time, um, matter of fact, I can tell you exactly when it was. It was one year and one week ago um, today that I made a Facebook post, right? And, and I, I, I put this post out there and people kind of push back on it. And when people push back on something that you have an opinion about, it kind of doesn't feel so good. I thought, I, I thought it was well-written. I thought that I articulated, big word for me to use, articulated well, okay? Um, I thought that I made some good points and I really thought that everyone would agree with me that Tom Brady is not the goat of football. I was really hoping you'd be here this morning. Um, And people disagreed with me, right? No, seriously, we can go in and we can write something on social media and it can be very eloquent and it can be um, very truthful. It can be even to do with Christ and Jesus. And I've, and I've done this. I've gone to social media and I have thought out really hard something that I, I would know or feel would be very theologically sound. And you go and you put that out on social media. And when I get pushback, when you get pushback, when someone comments on there and they completely disagree and they say, Are you, do you even know what you're talking about? Or they respond in some sort of fashion. That must be persecution. Maybe? No? I mean, I know there are, I know there are people out there in the world, probably nobody in this room, who goes to their social media just to write something that's going to instigate all sorts of lashback, right? So there's people out there, you know, you're like, you read somebody's post, you're like, I know that was intentional. 
right? Nobody in here has done that. But sometimes that's what happens. And then there's this times that we write something that we think is really, really good. And people disagree with us. But my post was about Jesus. It must be that I'm being persecuted. No, sorry. Persecution is not people disagreeing with your Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or whatever other social media platforms are out there that I don't know about. Persecution is not people disliking your opinions or your politics or the way you raise your kids or the way you eat certain foods or any of that type of stuff. That is not persecution. Persecution is not people disagreeing with you. There are Christians all around the world who have opposing views of certain parts of Scripture. We have theological differences and just because they, that there are people that think different than what we think doesn't mean that we're being persecuted. That's simply disagreeing. And in, and in our culture in America in 2022, it seems like if somebody is offended, if somebody offends me, then they must be persecuting me. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is not talking about people being offended. Jesus goes on in verse 11 and he says, um, he goes on to say, blessed are you when people insult you. When they persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil things because of me. Because when, when you speak like me, when you act like me, when you reflect me, we are living there for Christ. Not me, but Jesus. I say me, but third person, Jesus. When you talk like Jesus, when you act like Jesus, when you reflect Jesus, you are living out who Christ is. And that's where persecution begins. Persecution is not being persecuted because of you, because of something that you said on social media or something somewhere, and you thought it was really, really good. You're not persecuted because of what you have accomplished. We can sometimes think that we've done something really, really amazing and people just don't like it. Being offended is not being persecuted. There's two words that I've, I've really kind of held on to these last few weeks as I've been, been preparing for this message. And that is attacked and suffering, okay? I want you to, to grasp onto those two words, the two words that I think associate to what Jesus is talking about with persecution. When we are being attacked, it is causing us to suffer or suffer a loss. When we are being persecuted, it is causing us to suffer or suffer a loss. Well, Pastor Micah, what does being attacked look like? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. We'll start with something like this. Persecution will cost us something. Okay? Persecution will cost us something. We may suffer a loss of relationship. We may suffer a loss of finances. We may suffer a loss of reputation. We may suffer a loss of freedom. We may suffer a loss of life. There are several ways that being persecuted can cause us to suffer something. Being attacked for standing for Christ will cause us to suffer something in this world. Maybe you have a boss and, and your boss wants you to do something that is probably unethical. Your boss likes to lie and steal and cheat and wants you to do the exact same thing for what he might or she might say is the betterment of the company. But you know that, that Christ has called you to do something and live a life that's better than that. And so you know if you stand up to your boss and say, I, look, I'm, I'm a Christian, I follow Christ, I can't do these things. You know that that might cost you your job. You may suffer a loss of finances because you stood up and stood for Christ. 
I think this one, uh, you know, will resonate with our students better than, than the other one, although a lot of them have jobs. And I mean, I think maybe some adults like to, might try to get teens to do stuff that they, they shouldn't do in workplace. But this one, when, when you go out with friends, I mean, adults, we go out with friends. And your friends want you or invite you or ask you to do something that probably isn't holy, probably isn't in line with how Christ has called us to live. And you stand up and say, you know what? As a Christian, Christ has called me to something better. God's got a plan for my life and it doesn't include this. And then all of a sudden you lose relationships. You know, there's, we, we talk about teens being bullied. You know, there's adult bullies out there, All right? Adult, we, uh, uh, you know, we kind of sometimes think we hear the word bull and we always only think about students and teenagers, but there's adult bullies. And when we stand up and we stand for our faith, then those, those bullies come out. Amen. They begin to talk. They begin to spread things falsely, say all kinds of evil things against you. You lose reputation. You lose relationships. We can lose freedoms. That's, that's probably something that's not as common in our culture. There are areas where we lose freedoms because of our faith, because we stand for Christ. But that's probably even more so in the world around us, that there are those that lose their freedom. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. In America, we don't experience loss of life like we see in other countries. We have moments in time and, I, and we can think of moments where somebody in our culture in the United States of America has lost their life. I think to April 20th, 1999, uh, Columbine, okay? And these, these two students, they are coming to their school one day and just terrorize the school, taking lives. And they come up to this young girl, Rachel Scott, and they ask Rachel to denounce who Jesus is and denounce she was an open Christian. People knew where her faith stood and they said, denounce Christ. And instead of denouncing Christ, she claimed Christ and they took her life. Persecution is around the world right now. Christians are facing persecution everywhere. There's a threat of losing life and livelihood if you don't denounce who Christ is. Right now in China, there are hundreds of churches who have been forced to close their doors. Pastors and church members have been arrested and detained because of their faith. The online sale of Bibles have been prohibited. There's been a campaign to remove crosses from churches the government has installed more than 170 million facial recognition cameras. That's almost more than half of, we, of citizens of America. They've put a, a great amount of them near churches or even in churches in effort to identify those who are attending worship services. And if caught going to a worship service on one of these facial recognition cameras, it can cost you their credit rating. What a way to not be able to sometimes function in life just because you went to church. This is suffering for the sake of Christ, not suffering for what we can say and do, but this is what suffering for the sake of Christ looks like. Christian persecution is real. It exists and it happens in many different ways. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says this, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to stand firm in your faith for who Christ is, there, there is a persecution that comes. I'm not sure when it will be for you or for me, but there is a persecution that comes. But there is another side to this coin. As we started out with, there was two words that Jesus used in this passage. 
blessed and persecuted. And when, again, when Jesus speaks, there's value and it's truth. So do not hear what Jesus isn't saying, okay? We're gonna talk about blessed for a minute. Let's, do not hear what Jesus does not say. Blessed sometimes can get skewed in our thinking and, and what we think uh, of when we say we are to be blessed. Um, blessed does not mean that you're gonna get that brand new car, that much bigger house, much more money. That's probably improper. A lot more money. It doesn't mean that you'll never again suffer an illness or a sickness, okay? Being blessed isn't about all of these material items that we will gain, okay? I don't know. I, I know I've done this. I don't know. Maybe you haven't done this, so maybe this was just for me. Um, I know at some point in life, you know, received something that was of, uh, material uh, value, right? And it's something that maybe we really, really wanted or something that we really, really, really liked. And we go to social media and we type out a nice little big thing about it. And then we have to put the, at the end, hashtag blessed. You know, double the size of my house, hashtag blessed. Right? And so we can get caught up in, in this idea of what being blessed is. And, and yes, there is a level of thanking God for the good things that we get. Okay? Let's don't diminish that. There are the good things in life. We know that all good things come from, from God. But it absolutely does not mean that when I get persecuted, when I get attacked, when I suffer some form of loss, that my blessing is going to be this nice new material thing that we've just listed and talked about. Excuse me. I encourage you to think about the millions and millions of Christians all around the world who do not have access to blessings such as this. There are millions of Christians all around the world who do not have access to get a brand new car, to get a bigger house, or even a house. And so this is not the blessing that Jesus is talking about. So when Jesus says, be blessed when you are persecuted in my name, what does he mean? We've been in this series now for several weeks and nine times does Jesus say blessed in, this, in these 12 verses. Nine times. And that uh, several of those, many of those are then accompanied with something that doesn't make sense to go with a blessing. Okay, there's a, in, in this world, we would look at some of these says, blessed to be this. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are this. Ble and we sit here and go, well, that just doesn't make sense. That's because we need to understand what the blessing is. Because when we understand what the blessing is, it makes sense. We are blessed because we are followers of Christ. And we are not citizens of this world. We are not a part of this kingdom we are citizens of God's kingdom. We are citizens of heaven, not just when we die. We don't have a future citizenship in the kingdom of God. We have a current citizenship in the kingdom of God. It's not something that we have to wait for. It's not something that's going to come in the future. And to be blessed in these situations, to be blessed in persecution, to be blessed when we are being attacked, is to know that we have God's presence with us. We have God's righteousness with us. We have God's holiness with us. God provides us joy and peace that goes beyond all understanding. Even when we face persecution. When we face trials of many kinds, when we face persecution, when we face being attacked, we are blessed because God is among us. And when we are in a full relationship with God, we would rather face persecution than denounce who Christ is. You hear that? When, when we are in a full relationship with God, we would rather face the persecution than denounce who Christ is. Because we can know that we have a joy that only comes from God 
and not based on our situations. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This maturing and not lacking anything doesn't refer to the material possessions that we might need not to lack. It means that we are mature and not lacking in anything in our spiritual walk with Christ. When we face these trials, and some of these trials may have nothing to do with persecution, but many of them might, many of them will. And God said, and and here they're saying, God's saying, consider it a joy because it will bring upon maturity. As we begin to close the service, I'll ask the worship team to come back up. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are going around sharing about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. All right, there is a man that this is, this is after um, Jesus has ascended, there is a man who has been healed. Okay. And the Sadducees, the, the Jewish leaders of the time, they did not like what they were hearing from Peter and John. And so they had Peter and John locked up. Loss of freedom. This is a, this is a form of persecution that we are talking about. But before they were locked up, before they had time to to get them and throw them into jail, Peter and John shared about Jesus. And people heard. And people listened. And it says 5,000 were saved. 5,000 men, probably plus women and children, whenever we read that in Scripture. 5,000 men were saved. Then later in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John began to be questioned by these same Jewish leaders as to what or why they were doing and saying what they were doing and saying. Why would you say this about Christ? And they began to explain who Jesus is. And rather than backing down so they could guarantee their release, they spoke with courage, knowing that standing up for who Christ is could could put them back in, in that jail cell. But in Acts, it says they spoke with courage. And so with all the people that were there that had witnessed with what had happened and the man himself who had been healed, they really had no other choice but to let Peter and John go. And so Peter and John returned to their people and they began to pray. And this is what they say. This is a part of their prayer found in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says this, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. As that's our challenge today. When someone or some group of people is attacking you or per, uh, persecuting you, causing you to suffer some type of loss, we pray, God, give us the courage and the boldness to speak your name, to stand firm on who you are and what you're doing in my life. Because when Peter and John spoke, when they had courage, thousands were saved. And imagine if we go into our schools, into our workplaces, into our homes, into our community, and with courage and boldness, we stand up and speak in the face of persecution, in the face of suffering. What if we were to speak who Christ is? We are called to bring the kingdom of heaven 
to those in the world around us. Because there are competing kingdoms in this world. We are called to love God, to love others, and go. Let's stand as we close in worship.